screen. There we go. Um, so you just click continue to, to proceed. If you do not want to be recorded, you can go ahead and turn off your video and mute. Again, you can always hop on our Facebook page as well. Um, we don't anticipate any disruptions happening during today's webinar, but in the event that does happen, we will send an email out to registrants about, um, you know, reconvening at a later date. And then finally, we are going to be pausing for questions at the end of each of our speakers. So as they come to you, feel free to type in your questions in the chat, and then Ralph is going to be facilitating that during the course of our webinar today. I think that's all for me. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ralph to get, to get us started. Great. Thank you, Kasha. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Ralph Wilmer. I'm the Technical Assistance Manager and Principal Planner with MAPC. Today, we'll discuss some solutions that have been implemented by cities and towns since the pandemic uh, related to the uh, Commonwealth's reopening uh, started and how our current situation could lead to more efficient processes in the future. Um, clearly, municipalities have been grappling with how they should address permitting issues in the age of COVID. And in particular, they're looking for ways to address the reopening of their communities and to do so in an expedited manner consistent with local zoning and related regulations. MAPC has been fielding a lot of inquiries from our cities and towns, um, and we've been providing technical assistance on a variety of issues. And we'll give you some resources uh, at the end of the uh, session uh, today. Um, this webinar will focus on how to assist local restaurants, particularly those that are interested in facilitating outdoor dining options, which is the way they're going right now, and uh, how to deal with some other work outside, such as the installation of solar panels. Uh, this also includes electronic and virtual permitting practices, such as online checklists, streamlined processes um, that have existed to some extent uh, prior to COVID, but could be optimized and grown uh, for uh, the period during and hopefully post COVID. Uh, so, for example, for renewable and energy efficiency, these are some best practices that can enable uh, much greater deployment and help save greenhouse gas uh, emissions and uh, a number of other benefits. So today we'll be joined by Leah Robbins, our Senior Government Affairs Specialist with MAPC, and she'll give a legislative update. And then we have two municipal representatives, Paul Halkiotis, the Planning and Economic Development Director for the Town of Norwood, and he'll talk more about the outdoor dining permitting issue. And then Eric Slagle, who is the Director of Development Services with the City of Lowell, and he'll talk more about solar permitting. So um, hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on available strategies and resources to support your work and the ways in which MAPC might help if needed. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Leah. Awesome. Um, so if you want to advance the slides. Um, so glad to join you today. Um, again, my name is Leah Robbins. I'm a Senior Government Affairs Specialist at MAPC. I'm really excited to join you today. I, I want to take a few minutes at the beginning of our time together to situate us in some of the authority that's been granted to municipalities since the beginning of COVID-19. Um, we'll discuss some of the recent executive and emergency orders, some of the recent laws and pending legislation. I'm eager to talk about these provisions with you, but I also, um, and answer questions in the chat, um, but I do also wanna be clear from the outset that I encourage you to speak with your legal counsel for any specific legal questions. Kasha, do you have the slides up or? I do, can you see them? I am seeing the beginning slide. I'm not seeing, it's the slide that says, uh, we will begin shortly. I'm not seeing the other slides yet. Okay, just give me one second. Sure thing. <laughs> Are other folks seeing that we will begin shortly slide? Thumbs up if that is your experience. Okay. Thank you. Gonna 
restart my sharing. Maybe that'll help. Yeah. Yeah. That's Perfect. Nice. I'm not seeing share screen yet. Crossing fingers. Okay, I can see your screen. Perfect. Okay, you can advance to the next slide. Um, so for the executive and emergency orders, the, the um, executive order 591 that the governor issued um, on March 11th really is sort of the, the kickoff to a lot of these other initiatives that have followed. This is the order that established the authority for the governor to act and subsequent laws and emergency orders all tie to this um, executive order. Um, some of the FEMA and other federal funds also will refer to this declaration of emergency. Then on March 12th, the very next day, the governor issued an order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Um, this is the order that suspends the requirement for public access to the physical location where a public meeting is taking place, provided that there are other means of access available. This order is also still in effect today. Um, then on June 1st and then on June 6th, the governor issued the preparing for phase two reopening document and then the phase two reopening order. Um, relevant to our conversation today, um, this emergency order suspends the requirement. Um, this is the document that allows outdoor table service for food. Um, prior to this point, that had not been allowed um, in the Commonwealth. And it allows for municipalities to make changes to liquor licenses. So an establishment's liquor license can also be applied to the new outdoor space. Local lo licensing authorities, LLAs, um, are required to provide notice of this amended uh, license to the uh, Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission. Um, and this authority lasts until November 1st, 2020, or when the order is rescinded, whichever is sooner. And at that point, all licenses revert back to their prior status. Um, next slide. Oh, before I go on to the next slide, I just want to add to, like with many of the orders, um, other agencies will issue some further guidance. So in this case, the um, ABCC has offered some further guidance regarding restaurants. Um, I won't get into those today, but they do have some additional details on um, outdoor premises and some guidance there. So next slide. Um, the legislature has also made some statutory changes to further empower municipalities. Um, most relevant to our conversation today is Chapter 53 of the Acts of 2020, which was signed into law in early April. Um, largely, this bill um, created processes for towns to delay town meeting, created financial mechanisms for municipalities if they need to adopt a budget um, that is not timely in a normal year, um, and creates some local options around taxes. Relevant for our discussion today is Section 17, um, with, which um, deals with the suspension of certain deadlines affecting local permits and local permitting authorities. Um, so specifically, um, permits are defined um, very, well, how I read them is pretty broadly defined in this section. Um, this statute also discusses the application submission process, which said for the duration of the state of emergency, an application is deemed accepted as the date it is filed and certified received by the municipal clerk or the county clerk for regional entities. Um, and it allows for electronic submission and calls that out very explicitly. On the municipal process side, um, actions aren't required until 45 days after the termination of the COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, that's not to say that work has to stop. Um, the bill explicitly says that permit granting authorities may conduct business during this time. Um, and it allows for noticed meetings to be held and decisions to be made on duly noticed applications. Um, so that I find um, that balance is both in there of being able to hold on work and also being able to continue work. Um, next slide. I could spend a lot of time having talked about Section 17, but I'm just going to go very broad brush. Um, the legislature is also considering um, a number of bills related to restaurants. Um, and, and COVID-19 in general, the legislature has really been putting forward a number of different innovative ideas. I've called out these two as their vehicles that are currently um, moving. So House 4774 um, is currently before the Senate Ways and Means Committee. It has successfully passed the House um, and been voted on by, by that, by that uh, body. 
It moves into statute the ability for local licensing authorities to authorize the sale of alcohol with new permit location description. So what we've seen in the governor's order. It also adds in two pieces that I think might be of interest. Um, it allows for the sale of mixed drinks to be sold off premises consumption at establishments that are licensed only for the sale of on premise consumption. Um, with lots of description about what a closed container needs to look like. Um, it also uh, limits delivery fees from third party services, which I know is something a number of municipalities have taken up locally as well. Um, Senate 2730 and House Docket 5103. Um, filed by Senator Paul Feeney and Representative Paul McMurtry. I call it the Paul's bill. Um, it authorizes, um, it, it moves into statute the abilities that the governor had put forward in the executive order. So those bills are still pending. Um, I think those are some ways that the legislature is looking to find and create some more flexibility for municipalities in um, moving more restaurant services outdoors, particularly around serving liquor outdoors um, and all alcoholic beverages. We're in continued conversations too with the legislature about these proposals to continue to, to urge more flexibility for communities. We've heard some interest in expanding the deadline for when restaurants would need to um, revert back to their previous license. So extending outdoor service further into um, our astonishingly sometimes warmer winter months. So I will um, pause there. Um, I realize I just ran through things very quickly. If there are any questions, please pull them in the chat. I'm glad to talk more offline. Thank you. Um, so now we will uh, turn it over to uh, Paul Halkiotis uh, to talk a little bit more about the outdoor dining. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Paul. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, what the town of Norwood and um, my uh, fellow town officials did to uh, get ahead of things and open up for business for, um, for outdoor dining. We started with some regulations that were already in existence. Um, they were developed as part of um, a recommendation from the town's um, downtown master plan. Um, I took those regulations and with the instructions from the town manager, um, worked on streamlining the regulations to make for a quicker, easy approval. Our town manager um, was kind of ahead of the curve and he saw that uh, outdoor dining was gonna be something that would be coming um, before indoor dining was allowed. He got together a group of um, department heads and asked us to work together to get ready to uh, be able to uh, um, allow for some outdoor dining. So I took those existing regulations and I streamlined them, changed them from um, uh, regulations that required the selectman's approval to be administrative review and approval by the town department heads. <clears throat> and these regulations, um, were changed to apply to um, not only sidewalk dining, but to parking lots and lawn areas. Uh, we required that a plan be provided that you know, shows where all the equipment will be, um, any outdoor heaters, tents, tables, um, needed to be at least six feet apart. Um, and for uh, any applications that involve dining out on the sidewalk or on public property, uh, an insurance certificate was required. These pictures I'm showing you today were taken yesterday. This is Lewis's restaurant in downtown Norwood. Our review team involved um, the health department, the building commissioner, fire department, police safety officer, police liquor enforcement officer, the DPW and the planning department. The instructions for the restaurant owners were to uh, present a plan and we didn't ask for a real plan, um, some form of a sketch plan that showed uh, their, their uh, shop 
the extent of the sidewalk that they wanted to occupy and the area of the sidewalk that they wanted to utilize for outdoor dining. Um, they had to delineate that space and show it on a plan. Um, most of the plans that we received were not good. And um, a lot of the applications that we received were incomplete, but um, we made an effort to work with those business owners, going to meet with them on site to, to check out where they wanted to set up shop. And um, that proved to be the most valuable um, part of the review process once we had met on site with the restaurateurs. Um, the, the, it, the way that they define the space that they can utilize, um, there can be a number of options, temporary fence, planters, ropes, lattice, bollards, chains. Um, we saw a lot of creative approaches and um, we tried not to, be, not to be too prescriptive, but wanted to allow those restaurateurs to uh, decide how they wanted their outdoor space to look. Um, here's, here's one shot of the Carmen Cafe in downtown Norwood. Um, you can see that, that the DPW has set up some uh, barriers and um, they've set up some, uh, some temporary lattice work, umbrellas and tables. This is in front of uh, another establishment in the downtown. And um, what we needed to do as part of this was if the businesses were gonna be occupying the sidewalks, we had to um, make space for pedestrians within the uh, on-street parking lane. And so we worked with our DPW to uh, set up barriers so that pedestrians could walk by the outdoor dining space on the street, but still be protected by some kind of barrier from traffic. The permitting process was, was headed up by the, uh, the health department. Um, they lead the review process and they will make the final recommendations to the town manager on whether or not um, outdoor dining permits should be issued. Uh, they they check for uh, make sure that there was compliance with the state's guidance for outdoor dining and their standard requirements um, for uh, food and beverage operations. The building inspector um, took a, a pragmatic approach about this, and and we were glad that that he was logical and reasonable in, in how he looked at this, and and he said. You know, if the restaurants cannot operate at 100% capacity, they don't need 100% of the parking. And so um, the way the regulations were drafted, it said that the outdoor parking spaces uh, will not be counted towards, uh, the outdoor parking seats won't be counted towards the parking requirements. Fortunately, we know it has a number of uh, public lots and uh, now people are starting to use those lots and um, get out and walk to through the downtown to where they want to eat. Um, our approach was this is an emergency situation. It's very unusual. And so we were more interested in being practical and reasonable and pragmatic than to follow um, the, regulate, the letter of the law of the regulations. The building inspector wanted to make sure that if there were any tents that they were properly secured from the wind. Um, these outdoor dining operations are gonna be in place uh, probably until the fall. And as we all know, we get weather around here in the summer, particularly pop-up thunderstorms where it gets windy. So he was making sure that um, everything was secure, he wanted to make sure that umbrellas were secure, and he wanted to make sure that the fabric from any tents um, were not flammable. And unfortunately, I think that ruled out some cheap pop-up type tents. The DPW um, worked great and, and they set up temporary barriers for pedestrian access. They put signs out um, that said the sidewalk was closed in, in these areas and you had to step out onto the street and they provided um, handicapped accessibility with some small ramps up over the curbing. Um, this slide shows uh, the, the indication to the pedestrians that uh, the sidewalks being occupied by a restaurant step out uh, onto the street and uh, this is an example of uh, what they did to try to provide for handicapped accessibility they put um, made made these little ramps and um, they might not be 100 percent ada compliant but they they um, are going to work well for people with mobility issues um, and this shows that uh, the dpw had to kind of get creative with the barrier materials um, not always using Jersey barriers or heavy materials to separate the traffic, but in some cases they put out more lightweight barriers. Um, these are temporary and we may be, um, we have other barriers that are on, on order and we may be getting um, barriers that are, are a little more um, protective, separating the pedestrians from the traffic. 
fire department reviewed all the plans, did all the site visits. They wanted to make sure that they had access to the building and we required on the application form if um, the restaurant owner was interested in using any outdoor type heaters, that they let the fire department know so that they can inspect them and see where they were gonna be located. Planning department, um, I worked on writing the regulations and, and getting them approved, helped to coordinate um, with the other departments in the drafting of the regulations. And then as the permitting process moved forward, um, we helped to coordinate that. It's another shot of downtown Norwood. Here you can see some shiny new plastic, uh, water-filled Jersey barriers. Um, and uh, you can see that the restaurant owners really did a nice job of, of trying to uh, throw out some planters and make it an attractive place for people to sit out on the sidewalk and dine like they do in the rest of the world. Um, we tried to, in some cases, set up uh, separate parking spaces so that uh, uh, People that wanted to pick up to go orders could pull right up in the DPW, set up some signage and uh, help to carve out um, a place for pickup orders to be picked up, separated from the uh, people sitting on the sidewalk. Um, all, uh, any restaurants that wanted to serve alcohol, those required um, separate approval from the Board of Selectmen. And our Board of Selectmen met several times, um, two or three times a week in some cases over the last couple of weeks to try to be responsive and to try to um, help those restaurant owners that, that wanted to provide alcohol service. Police department worked with us. They were you know, looking for overall public safety, pedestrian safety, compliance with the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission regulations, making sure that, um, that, that the areas that were gonna be used for serving food and beverages were properly corded off from uh, the rest of the, of the surrounding area. And um, they were part of the whole review process with our team. The shot shows uh, the barriers, the closed sidewalks. Uh, we also did something that we should have done a long time ago, which is to throw some tab uh, picnic tables out on the town common. And we're trying to make uh, our common more inviting. Um, and so we did that, and I think those are gonna be a permanent fixture moving forward. The town is also in the process of closing off a short section of street um, that will be an extension of the town common. And um, this is gonna start uh, <clears throat> tomorrow morning at seven. The DPW is gonna close off a short section of road. We're gonna roll out some uh, AstroTurf, put up some string lighting, and some outdoor furniture. And we're hoping that people that um, step outside, out to dine and take, take out orders can, can utilize that space, meet friends um, and socialize outside in a safe manner. That's all I have for today. Um, Nord was really, um, I think, ahead of the curve, uh, uh, ahead of some other municipalities that were working on this. Our town manager got us um, going on this a uh, couple of weeks before the governor allowed for outdoor seating. And um, we came in on the Saturday before June 8th when the window opened and uh, the department heads on that team and I got together and reviewed all of the applications together. Then we broke up and went out into the field and met with the, um, with the restaurant owners. And by the end of the day, um, all the applications were in pretty good shape and we were able to recommend to the Board of Selectmen to approve them. So then on June 8th, when the governor opened the window for outdoor dining, we had um, 12 or 15 um, restaurants that were all pre-approved and ready to go. And we thought we needed to do that to help our, our business community that's really struggling from the, impact, the economic impacts of, uh, of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so the first one is, how did you decide on placing the tables on the sidewalk and rerouting people walking versus having the tables in the former parking spaces? So Norwood has a, has a great traditional downtown with a straight section of street with, with um, uh, the buildings right on the sidewalk. So it was it was an either or. So if, if the business was in the main um, Washington Street section downtown, they would occupy the sidewalk. There were some other restaurants um, that aren't in the main downtown area and uh, they set up in the parking lot. In a couple of instances, those restaurants asked the town to provide some Jersey barriers to block out a space for them. And fortunately we were able to do that 
Um, we have other areas of town where there, um, there are bigger restaurants like the ones on Route 1 and those restaurants, we see them um, setting up out in their parking lot and setting up tents and, and getting prepared to, uh, to do business for the rest of the summer. Okay. And the second question that we have is, uh, who's responsible for keeping the areas clean and did you add extra trash barrels or schedule additional pickups? We put it right in the um, outdoor dining rules and regulations that the uh, the restaurants were in charge of taking care of their own trash and keeping their area that they're utilizing clean. And so we put that on them. That's usually what they have to do. Um, and so we just incorporated that, incorporated that into the regulations. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I will now turn it over to Eric for his presentation. And then we'll have some more uh, opportunities for Q&A. So uh, continue to throw them in the chat if you have any. Thank you, folks. Um, my name is Eric Slagle. I'm the Director of Development Services for the City of Lowell. Uh, so uh, my department handles all of the permitting and land use processes for the city. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit today about the uh, way that the city of Lowell has handled its solar permitting um, over the last few years. Um, so I, this is stepping a, little bit, stepping a little bit away from COVID for, for a bit. Um, uh, back in 2017, uh, the city undertook a process where um, we were uh, striving to be certified as a uh, SolSmart Gold municipality. Um, uh, as part of that process, we needed to uh, take a look at all our internal procedures and make sure that we were doing everything that was possible to, uh, to, to make sure that solar permitting could happen in the most streamlined and efficient manner uh, possible. Um, uh, so that um, took several different fronts. Um, uh, the, the first and most basic issue that we had with our solar permitting, I think a lot of municipalities have is, uh, how many chefs are in the kitchen? Um, solar permitting, as everybody knows, uh, can touch several different disciplines. Um, uh, first and foremost, it's obviously an electrical uh, uh, permitting process. Um, but uh, as uh, solar becomes more prevalent and the solar um, uh, installations get, uh, get larger, uh, there's also a very strong structural um, issue with respect to, to solar. And then, and then there's the the zoning um, and conservation issues that arise around solar, depending on whether it's ground mounted or, or, or roof mounted. Um, uh, the, the first thing that the city did, the first thing that we strove to do, was try to figure out a, a way to make sure that the solar process had to touch the least amount of people in the city as possible. As we as municipal employees know, municipal bureaucracy, bureaucracy is not the quickest. Um, and so the, the least number of, of uh, people that have to handle a permit, uh, the more likely it is that it is uh, fed through uh, the municipal process. Uh, as such, the first, the first decision that the city made was we were gonna have each and every solar permit um, uh, comprise one application only, which would be electrical application. Um, uh, the city of Lowell is lucky in that our development services department has the building commissioner, has all of the health inspectors, has all of the building inspectors, but also has all the trade inspectors and all of the planners that administer the land use boards all under one roof. Um, so we have one application that comes into the department to the electrical inspector for any kind of solar, whether it's roof mounted or ground mounted. Um, then the electrical inspector um, makes the determination as to whether or not um, there's a structural component that requires review by a building inspector. Um, we don't require that the, that the uh, permit applicant do that evaluation beforehand. Um, that's done by the electrical inspector and they work in tandem with a building inspector to do simultaneous reviews of structural and electrical components when an application comes in. The idea obviously is to try to get uh, to sync up these evaluations so that uh, each and every solar permit gets rolled out in what we call a fast track process. Um, uh, the fast track process is um, a process that is 
abbreviated schedules for review um, with uh, the intent to try to turn around permits in 24 to 48 business hours. Um, uh, that's um, uh, in the, the scope of building permits that can sometimes take up to 30 days, that can be aggressive, um, but it's one of the things that we did in an effort to try and make sure that this process um, moved as smoothly as possible. Um, the second thing that we did uh, in our preparation for uh, trying to get this old smart gold uh, label was to take a look at our zoning ordinance um, and uh, try to make sure that the zoning ordinance didn't either deliberately or unintentionally provide an impediment to any kind of solar application in the city. Um, we wanted to try to eliminate any kind of gray areas or um, uh, discretionary uh, permitting that would uh, require a delay on the part of an applicant to get a solar, uh, solar array, a solar installation uh, taken care of uh, in front of a board. Um, so we did uh, a rewrite of our, of our uh, zoning ordinance that included um, uh, solar as a matter of right, including ground mounted solar up to a certain square footage um, uh, in uh, and around all of the, the uh, zones within the city. Um, this was somewhat controversial. Um, I think that there's still a, uh, a portion of the populace that um, sees uh, solar installations as um, odd. Um, and so we did some outreach to neighborhood groups um, as part of this zoning change to um, uh, let them know what our goals were, both the goals of sustainability and environmental uh, friendliness, uh, green living that the city was striving for. Um, uh, and also to let them know the thought process behind the square footage that we chose. Um, and so once we um, had done the groundwork with the neighborhood groups to, um, uh, to put forward this uh, zoning ordinance, we uh, proposed it to the city council as part of a kind of a larger package of zoning changes. Uh, and it was passed by the city council to allow solar as a matter of right um, throughout the city. Um, this eliminated the somewhat time consuming discretionary process of special permitting um, the, that some municipalities have for solar um, and allowed us to be able to say with a straight face that we were intentionally trying to get solar permits out the door in less than a week. Um, um, the other thing that we realized that we needed to do as part of this um, um, is do uh, some education. Um, so part of what Lowell did and worked with a consultant on was to create um, solar landing pages, not only for um, uh, the solar companies, solar installers who did the, 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 the applications, but also for residents to be able to um, um, kind of work backwards from the permitting process. Um, uh, Lowell has been uh, striving for, for several years to um, be a green community. Um, uh, and as part of that, we wanted to educate the populace in um, at every stage up to and including the application and installation of a solar system um, and what the consumer should be looking for um, to uh, make sure that they were um, installing solar in the most efficient way possible. Um, and while that doesn't necessarily translate into municipal efficiency, um, um, on the back end, it does translate into a more educated uh, consumer, which from our perspective creates some of the problems that we sometimes have with uh, permitting in municipalities, which is a disconnect between the, the customer who's hiring the installer and the municipality. Um, uh, we, uh, I've included copies that I think got sent out to all the folks of um, the city's solar landing page. We made use of some state and, uh, and private entity resources on the landing page to try to do some outreach and education to folks who are interested in solar. Um, and we created a, um, a, a very brief you know, two-page uh, checklist for the installers themselves um, that talks about the specific information that's needed uh, to process a solar permit in the quickest way possible, um, including laying out the specific you know, fee amounts as, as, as clearly as possible so that the installers would not have to uh, do any interface with staff 
prior to their application that would create any kind of delay. Um, as a result, since 2017, we have seen a significant increase in the solar installations in the city. Um, we um, uh, have um, um, gotten a lot of kudos from the industry itself, but also from homeowners who have been looking to install solar and have been able to turn around their solar installations in a relatively short order. Um, um, so the, the, again, the basic is you come in, you apply for an electrical permit. Um, the, uh, there, as part of our permitting process in Lowell, um, uh, the, the data management system that we use flags um, uh, other, part, uh, other staff that need to review permitting. Um, the electrical inspector makes the determination as to whether there needs to be a structural component reviewed. Um, the system that we use, which is called Munis, uh, flags uh, the planner to make sure that the uh, installation uh, is um, within the size that's allowed as a matter of right. Um, all of that review happens simultaneously and hopefully, um, knock on wood, within uh, 24 to 48 hours, we are turning around um, solar permits, oftentimes much faster um, if they don't require a, a, a structural review. Um, so that's my, uh, my little talk. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to, to, to take them. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we do have uh, one question um, that came in here so far. Have you experienced residents that are concerned about the safety of ground mounted solar? We hear concerns around fires, explosions of battery storage systems, contamination from the panels themselves, et cetera. And if so, how do you address um, those concerns and what resources do you use for educating people about them? Um, that's a great question. Um, we don't have, we haven't had those any, those questions come in since we passed the zoning back in 2017. Those were some of the concerns that were raised by the neighborhood groups when we um, started the process to change the zoning to, to streamline the, the, the solar permitting. Um, the um, kind of the, 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 the resources that we used um, to, to talk to folks about that, um, I, I think we just, we, we relied a lot on the, the, the state websites about solar installations. Um, um, I have included, again, on, on, on our landing page, there's a, a lot of different information about solar, um, but it hasn't been a problem since we, we've started the streamline process. It hasn't been. Thank you. Um, has the, uh, does the city have any plans to digitize other uh, permitting processes? Um, or are there any uh, lessons learned that you can translate to these other processes? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. The city's in the process right now of, I think like a lot of municipalities, trying to um, move uh, quicker than they were before uh, to get all our permitting done online, uh, get our uh, plan submission um, electronic as opposed to paper. Uh, in an effort to, in this stage where we, the city of Lowell City Hall hasn't been open since the middle of March um, to the public. So we have been um, uh, endeavoring to process things um, electronically as well as possible. We are we're moving to online permitting and we expect to be there sometime in the next two or three months. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions that uh... Anyone has for either Paul or Eric? Or anyone uh, have any ideas about, uh, or ideas that they would like to share about how their municipality is approaching permitting during this time? Not quite uh, related to what we're dealing with uh, today, but um, last year when I was at the American Planning Association conference, I attended a, um, a session uh, in Santa Rosa, uh, which was uh, heavily damaged by the wildfires. And uh, they had a lot of interesting examples about how they turned over their permitting for you know, literally thousands of buildings that had to be uh, rebuilt. So you may want to look to see how Santa Rosa has handled it. Um, we do have another question that came in. Uh, what permitting software do you recommend for online permitting? 
Um, I think there's lots of people on this call who could probably chime in on that one, but um, uh, we use Munis. It's the software that we've had in, um, in Lowell since I started, which is 15 years ago. So um, they started doing the permanent code enforcement module in 2009. Um, and so for the last 11, almost 12 years, that's been the permitting module. So we're doing our online permitting through that. I, I know there are lots of different, uh, people have lots of different opinions about um, on online permitting um, and whether or not it needs to be tied in to the greater financial permitting that your municipality uses or whether it should be a standalone module. Um, my experience has been the standalone modules typically work better for the pure permitting piece, um, but sometimes lack the interconnectivity to connect with, say, your treasurer or your um, your uh, other departments that are online to make sure that they are kept, the assessor's office, for instance, to make sure that they're kept abreast of any kind of permitting that happens. I know that this question comes up a lot and we've had, um, if you follow the mass planners listserv, the question is asked fairly frequently. And if you go into the archives, you'll probably see a lot of the other uh, discussions and recommendations that people might have about uh, systems that have worked well for them. I'm not seeing any other comments or questions in the chat at the moment. So do we want to just proceed with the final couple of resource slides? Sure, that sounds good. I'll go ahead and share my screen once more. Hopefully folks can see that okay. So Great. are you going to, should I do this or? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. If, if you'd okay. like to are off and then I can just conclude with the, okay. the last slide. Uh, so uh, as, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, MAPC has been uh, having a, a uh, or handling a lot of requests for um, follow up on, on these issues. We've, um, uh, dedicated a number of our technical assistance resources to uh, dealing with COVID related issues, whether it's housing or economic development. Um, and clearly, as, as Leah mentioned, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on legislative advocacy around the executive orders and the legislation that she talked about. So here's her, uh, her contact information up on top. If you're looking for more information on outdoor dining or economic development and permitting related issues in general, Betsy Cowan is our chief of economic development and her email is there. Uh, for clean energy, Nicole Sanchez uh, is a great resource person um, that you can reach out to for advice on, on those related issues. And Ryan Kelly has been doing uh, a lot of work around uh, e-permitting and, and communications and so on and so forth. He's our digital services director. So uh, any number of these people uh, can uh, provide assistance to you. And if they turn out not to be the exact uh, best person, we will refer you to uh, someone who could better answer your questions. So for, for those of you that are interested in engaging um, a little bit deeper in the conversations around solar, MAPC is joining the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and SolSmart in a webinar in about a month or so. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we plug this now and um, we will include this information as well in a follow-up email to everyone who, who registered. So just wanted to, to make sure folks know that we're, we're eager to continue this conversation with our partners. So with that, unless anyone else has any um, uh, last remarks that they'd like to offer, um, thank you all so much for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Again, MAPC has put on a number of webinars, two in particular that may be of interest to you all. Um, our economic development team put on a webinar about a month ago at this point focused on resources for small businesses. And then about two weeks ago, we had a webinar 
focusing on shared streets. So there's certainly some permitting elements in there if folks want to go check out the recordings of, of those webinars if you weren't able to make it. Um, we're continuing to, to host webinars into the future. We have a couple of exciting topics in the pipeline. So we really appreciate your attention, your engagement. A really big thank you to Paul and Eric for lending their time and expertise today. Very grateful to, to learn from you both. And if folks have any questions, um, you can see here, Sasha Parodi is the, the person to contact. Um, with that, thank you all for your time today and have a great rest of your day.